The Old Testament is full of lessons for us in the New Testament age. What do we learn from the things chronicled in those 39 books? We'll talk about four fundamental lessons from the Old Testament right now on Let the Bible Speak. From the Churches of Christ, Let the Bible Speak with Evangelist Kevin Presley. After Jesus died on the cross, God made a new covenant with His people. And the writer of Hebrews tells us that when that new covenant was made, the old covenant that God at one time had with the children of Abraham vanished away, according to Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 13. That old covenant is revealed in the history of and the law given unto the Jews as recorded in the Old Testament. And the Old Testament records the history of God's relationship to man before the cross. And the New Testament reveals the wonderful age of salvation through faith in Jesus, which fulfilled and led to the end of that Old Testament law. Now, there are many who falsely believe and teach that the Christian is still subject to the Old Testament law. But that's simply not true because Paul plainly taught in several passages like Colossians 2 and verse 14 that that law was fulfilled and done away with in Christ's death upon the cross. So, why is the Old Testament even in our Bibles? I mean, why should we read it and try to understand it? Does it serve any purpose for the Christian? Well, absolutely. In fact, you will never really understand the New Testament until you understand the Old Testament. Uh, one of the greatest stories of all time is that of Israel under the leadership of Moses leaving the bondage of Egypt and inheriting the land that God promised them. But that triumph did not come without trial and tragedy. In fact, the ones who crossed the Red Sea before Pharaoh's army were not the same ones who conquered the land of Canaan 40 years later. Uh, only two people of the multiplied thousands who left Egypt actually entered into Canaan. The rest died in the wilderness during the 40 years that they wandered there. They murmured, they complained, they practiced idolatry. Uh, they did about everything they could do to disobey and anger the Lord. The Bible reminds us about that sinful generation in Psalm 106, verses 13 and 14. They soon forgot God's works. They waited not for His counsel, but lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert. And finally, you see, God's patience ran out. God said, They shall not see the land which I swore unto their fathers, neither shall any of them that provoked me see it. Your carcasses shall fall in the wilderness. And that's exactly what happened. Joshua and Caleb were the only two who realized the promise that they left Egypt to obtain. Now, Paul reminds us of those events in the wilderness in 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, beginning in verse 5. And we'll use this as the premise of our Bible lesson today. Paul says here, But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. So you see, Paul says the Old Testament was recorded and preserved, even for us who are not subject to its ceremonial law, because of some fundamental lessons that it teaches us yet today. And so that's our study today, lessons from the Old Testament. And we'll look at four of them next. We 
Several years ago, I baptized an older gentleman, and before I did, I asked him to confess his faith in Christ like the Ethiopian eunuch did in Acts chapter 8. Well, he did so, and then he looked out at the congregation and very proudly said, and I just want everybody here to know that I believe it all from Exodus to Revelation. Well, I think maybe he was a little confused about the canonical order of the books of the Bible. Either that or I'm not really sure why he was so skeptical of Genesis. But nevertheless, there are many people who will say, I believe all of the Bible, or where I go to church, we preach all of the Bible, not just the New Testament. Well, I believe all of the Bible as well, from Genesis to Revelation. I believe what Paul wrote in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And I believe that all Scripture is not only from God, but that it was given for a purpose. None of the Holy Scripture is untrue, or none of it is irrelevant to our knowledge of Jesus Christ. A friend, the entire book is about Him. But the Scriptures do teach that we don't live under the law of Moses as the Jews did. Uh, we are free from that law. It was fulfilled in Christ and taken away at the cross. But it is still germane and relevant to our faith in Jesus and our understanding of salvation. Now in Galatians chapter 3, when Paul taught the Gentile Christians that they were not to live under that law, he then rhetorically asked in verse 19, Wherefore then serveth the law? In other words, if the law was removed, why was it given in the first place? What does it have to do with us? Well, Paul answered his own question in at least two other places. In Romans chapter 15, in verse 4, Paul says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. He also said in the passage we read a few moments ago, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 11, Now all these things happen unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. So one of the reasons, even we who are Gentiles and not a party to the Old Covenant, have been given the Old Testament record is because of the fundamental lessons that we learn from it. Well, there are four lessons that we can and should learn from the Old Testament. And the first lesson is that God is holy, and therefore God abhors sin. Uh, look at verse 5 of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Paul here says, But with many of them God was not well pleased. Why? Well, because they had disobeyed Him. They had sinned against Him. They broke His law. And those people learned in a very real and personal way that God hates and will punish sin. Now, there's a lot of punishment and violence in the Old Testament. Admittedly, it is a bloody book. That's very true. But my friend, have you ever stopped to think about the fact there's a lot of grace in the Old Testament too? I mean, the very fact that anybody lived to have their story told, and the very fact that we now today live and exist on this planet to read the Old Testament, uh, that in and of itself is a testament to God's mercy. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, you know, people often try to discredit the Bible by saying that a loving God would never do the things that we read about in the Old Testament, all the bloodshed, uh, the people who died at the hand of God's vengeance, why the suffering that even God's own people were put through. Friend, it's not amazing that God would punish sin if you understand the holiness and the righteousness of God. What's amazing is that anybody lived the Old Testament I mean, I'm at a much greater loss to explain how a holy God could save a sinful man than I am to explain how a loving God could punish wickedness. I mean, that's the question. How can a just and holy God save any of us? We don't deserve His salvation. We don't deserve to live because we have sinned against Him. Paul said in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Uh, according to 1 John 3 and verse 4, sin is the transgression of God's law. And according to Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Now we only live because of the mercy and the patience of God. 
And so, yes, the Old Testament may be full of wrath, but it's just as full of mercy. You see, God had every reason and God had every right to wipe the earth clean of sinful man from nearly the beginning. But he suffered long in order that in the fullness of time, Jesus might come to redeem us from our fallen state and restore us to God in righteousness and to make us holy through the redemptive work of Christ on the cross. Now God was and is bound by His own holiness to punish sin. And you know, as God was weaving a picture in the loom of time, beginning in Genesis chapter 2 all the way to the cross, He was painting the picture that He hates sin. He cannot countenance sin. And He is bound by His very own nature, not just His choice, His nature, to punish sin. Uh, what did God tell Adam when He told him not to eat of the fruit that grew upon the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in Genesis 2? He said, The day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die, Genesis 2 and verse 17. Now interestingly, when Satan approached Eve with the forbidden fruit, what did he tell her? He said that eating of it would not cause her to die. Uh, in other words, Satan was challenging the holiness and the truthfulness of God even then. Uh, he was telling her, you can sin against God and not be punished. Uh, God really didn't mean what you think He said. And you know, if God had overlooked Adam and Eve's sin, He would have defied His own nature and corrupted and made a mockery of His own law. So God cursed them and He drove them out of His garden of righteousness and divine fellowship and He placed at the entrance of that garden cherubim or angels with a flaming sword that guarded His own perfection and holiness from the taint of man's sin. Now fast forward to the days of Noah in Genesis 6. Man there had become so sinful and so disobedient that verse 6 says, It repented the Lord that He made man on the earth. And God wiped the earth clean of its wickedness by means of the great flood. Uh, the fire that fell from heaven and consumed the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis chapter 19. That speaks eloquently of God's hatred for sin. Not the sinner, but of sin. And you know, every drop of blood that was shed in the Old Testament is a token of God's detestation of sin. The prophet later wrote, Your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid His face from you that He will not hear. Isaiah chapter 59, verses 1 and 2. God said, I hate every false way. Psalm 119, verse 128. The psalmist said, Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Psalm 45 and verse 7. Now the problem is the religious community in America in the 21st century has largely forgotten all about the holiness of God. But that message is thundered from the pages of the Old Testament and it is one of the fundamental lessons that the Old Testament teaches us today. Now second of all, the Old Testament teaches us the lesson that God desires obedience. God desires obedience. He's not only holy, He desires, yea, even demands our obedience. You know, when Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 enumerated the sins of the Israelites in the wilderness, he then said in verse 11, Now all of these things happen unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Now, what is an admonition? Well, it's a rebuke or it's a warning. Well, what's Paul warning us about? The consequences of disobedience. You see, the Lord teaches us by means of the law that we are subject to Him. And our place is to submit to God and to obey Him. I mean, we hardly get out of the Garden of Eden. And once again, man shows his propensity to sin. Cain and Abel, uh, you recall, prepare sacrifices to offer to God. But Cain, he didn't seek God after the due order. Abel did. Cain did not. Uh, he offered his own kind of sacrifice instead of the bloody kind that God required. And you know, despite the value of his vegetable offering, despite the motive out of which he offered it, uh, despite the beauty of it, despite the amount of sacrifice of his time and effort and toil it might have taken to provide it, the fact is God rejected it because it wasn't what God commanded. Well, there's a vital lesson in that for you and for me today when it comes to our seeking salvation. 
and when it comes to offering worship to God. And that lesson is that God doesn't desire our brilliant schemes and our well-meaning substitutions and our efforts of self-merit. Uh, he doesn't look for our exciting and cutting-edge innovations. He rejects all of that. He desires simple and humble and reverent obedience. There's an outstanding example in the Old Testament in the life of Saul, the first king of Israel. Now God had a very simple and straightforward order to Saul. He wanted Saul to settle an old score and to go and destroy the Amalekite people. Now that wasn't arbitrary violence on the part of God. These were wicked people who had done great harm in the past to his people. And so God told Saul, you go and you destroy them. Don't just hurt them. He said, you destroy them. He said in 1 Samuel 15 and verse 3, utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not. That means he was to kill every single one of them and he was to even kill their livestock. They were to be wiped off the face of the earth. Well, I suppose that all sounded fine to Saul and he went off to fulfill God's command. But when he got there, he came up with a little different idea. Now, now he killed the Amalekites. Uh, that is to say, he went in and did exactly what God sent him there to do up to a point. But he gets to the king and well, Saul, he was arrogant and presumptuous and Saul, he thinks, uh, not God now, Saul thought, you know, why shouldn't I bring King Agag back alive? I mean, that, that's a trophy to bring the king back bound and captive. And you know, come to think of it, these sheep and these oxen, some of them are mighty fine animals. And well, these would make wonderful sacrifices to offer to the Lord. So you see, he wasn't trying to deceptively and underhandedly do something immoral or overtly evil. Uh, he just thought, I can do something here for God. Uh, the problem is, these sacrifices that he was so determined to offer to God weren't what God wanted. God didn't ask for the king to be brought back alive. God said, you kill every last one of them. I don't want an Amalekite person or animal left alive. So Saul comes home and the prophet Samuel, he comes one morning to inquire about the success of Saul's mission. And about the time that Saul was telling Samuel, oh yes, we went and we did what God said. We destroyed the Amalekites. He was telling him about this great battle that they waged. And about then Samuel hears the bleat of sheep and the lowing of an ox off in the distance. And Samuel says, hey, wait a minute, what's this that I hear? Saul says, oh, that will, well, those are the best of the animals. Now we brought, we, we, we found them over there and these people now, they brought them back to offer us a sacrifice to God. Well, that was it. God stripped Saul of his kingly robe and thus began the demise of his administration. God rejected him as king. 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verse 22 says, And Samuel told Saul, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. Now why did the Spirit of God preserve that story for us? Well, for one reason, because even today, under a different law and different dispensation, God wants obedience. Not our own inventions of worship and service. He wants simple, humble obedience. And you can never do anything greater to please and glorify the Lord than to simply and humbly take God's word for what it says in faith and obey Him. So that's the second lesson that we learn from the Old Testament. But then there's a third lesson. And that third lesson is that God rewards obedience. Now, it wasn't all bloodshed and vengeance and punishment in the Old Testament. Oh no, there were, there were people whom God greatly blessed and highly favored. Uh, people whom God exalted and He enriched. I think about Noah. The Bible says that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord in a time when God was ready to destroy mankind. Noah found grace. God made a provision. What does the Bible tell us Noah did? It says he moved with fear and he prepared an ark. He set out to do exactly what God told him to do in the way God told him to do it. And he built an ark. Uh, Abraham. Abraham, he followed God and he went in search of the country that God called him to. 
Why, his faith even led him to the crest of that mountain where he nearly sacrificed his own son to God because that's what God said in order to test his faith. Well, Abraham was rewarded for all of that. He is the greatest example of faith and the reward that follows obedient faith that can be found in all of God's Word. And so the rewards and blessings of God upon people of faith, that's another important lesson to us from the Old Testament, that God not only detests and punishes sin, but that He loves the faithful and He rewards obedience. Hebrews chapter 11 is called the roll call of the faithful or faith's hall of fame. And it chronicles the lives of great people who not only believed God, but obeyed Him. And these things are, as Paul said, written for our learning. But now the fourth lesson that I want us to learn from the Old Testament is this, that God's patience with sinners is limited. Now, as I said, the very fact that humankind survived to even have and read the Old Testament is itself a testimony to God's enduring patience, His grace, His mercy. You know, though God had to punish sin, in the very same event, He also promised mercy. And He finally and He ultimately mingled those two opposing things together with the blood of Calvary. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, John chapter 3 and verse 16, the golden text of the Bible. While we were yet sinners, Paul said, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. Romans chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. And you know, even now, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9 tells us that God is long-suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You know, the truth from Genesis 1 to Revelation chapter 22 is that God wants all men to be saved. That's, that's God's great desire. I hear people sometimes say, well, how can the world continue on? I mean, you turn on the evening news, you pick up the morning paper, and you see the moral and the spiritual mess. You see the state of decay that this world is in spiritually. You see how men have just, uh, by and large, rejected God, rejected His Son, and you say, how can it go on? How much longer? Why does God allow time to continue? Well, I know one reason. Because He desires for men to be saved. His mercy endures a long time. A day is but a thousand years. A thousand years is as a day, Peter there tells us. And he says that God is not willing that any should perish. But yet he tells us the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. And how long has God's mercy and patience undeservingly lasted? But yet the Old Testament has a stark lesson for us that God's patience has a limit. He will not always allow wickedness to continue. But there comes a day when He will finally destroy those who are determined to continue in sin. Now you know as the Israelites wandered through the wilderness in unbelief, rebellion, complaining, God graciously still kept them. He still provided for them. He didn't give up on the promise that He had made. He still held out the promise of the land of Canaan until one day they finally went too far. And then the sentence came. Uh, he said it like this in Numbers chapter 14. He said, How long shall I bear with this evil generation which murmur against me? Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness. Numbers 14, 27 through 29. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, that serves as an example to us. It's a lesson to us. God's eternal principles are still at work today. He's still long-suffering, not willing that any should perish. My friend, He's still waiting right now for you to obey the gospel. He's waiting for you to be baptized, to bring your life to Him in humble faith and repentance. But for some reason, you keep putting it off. You keep delaying. You keep remaining in your sin. One day, the last grain of sand is going to pass through God's hourglass, and that's going to be it. Israel wasn't warned, well, all right now, three more sins, and you'll be punished. God was patient, and He was patient, and He was patient, and He was still patient. 
until one day he had enough. And the Old Testament today teaches us God's patience has a limit. If you'd like to take a deeper look at what we talked about today, I hope you'll contact us and ask for the study, Lessons from the Old Testament. We'll send you a free copy. And also, don't forget to enroll in our Bible Correspondence course. Simply contact us at the information we'll give you here in just a moment. Be sure to make plans to join us, Lord willing, right back here next time for Let the Bible Speak. Until then, may the Lord bless you. Let the Bible Speak is brought to you by your friends in the Churches of Christ.